souhaiterais dédier cette intervention à deux personnes malheureusement décédées. L'historien Maxime Steinberg, as well as Alexander Oller, the son of the late David Oller, who would have probably decided to be among us today. Merci. Mon propos. Mon propos sera donc l'évocation d'une personne en particulier, David Oller, un artiste juif, a Jewish artist, uh, David Oller, who was one of the prisoners of the Zonda commando in Birkenau. And uh, we'll see what's the relationship with the, the, uh, between him and the contemporary artists uh, during and uh, after the war. The artwork is uh, unique in documenting the Shoah, but the individual uh, a pathway of David Oller is symbolic, symbolic for the way the members of the Sonderkommando were treated. So I would uh, focus from, well, I would shift from uh, the detailed uh, description of David Oller's life to the more general level um, biography, just to give you a brief outline. David Oller is born in Poland, in uh, Warsaw, in 1902, and he's um, quite quickly um, noted because of his artistic uh, skills. He moves from uh, Gdansk to Berlin at the Academy of Art, and in uh, Berlin he's uh, well integrated in the uh, artistic world. He gets uh, recognition, but he doesn't want to stay in, in Berlin or in Germany, and he asks um, uh, he applies for the French nationality. He wants to live in France. And in, the, uh, in Paris, in the 20s, the Roaring Twenties, he continues his career, especially in the world of movies. You see two uh, posters he uh, uh, crafted, Les Miserables in 36, and, and the other one. À la création de décors uh, for de Marcel Pagnol. And he also uh, um, develops decors. He um, uh, hangs out with people like Michel Simon, Henri Bob, <laughs> and the like. But his um, talent as an artist uh, leads, of course, to the fact that he uh, gathers a lot of friends in the, in the, uh, the sector, but his, um, uh, there's another, another thing uh, quite striking, and that's his address. 55 Boulevard Montparnasse is the so-called uh, artist's residence, which is uh, an indication that he was already recognized as um, an established artist uh, in those years. The same applies to La Grande Chaumière, um, which was a favorite hangout for recognized uh, artists. Um, this Grande Chaumière still exists, by the way and it still hosts um, trainings uh, in the field of art. He also exhibited at the uh, Artists' Fair in Grand Panais, which uh, is not without importance. Then in the uh, 30s, he applies for the, national, uh, for the French nationality, he gets it in 37, and that's why there's two um, ways of writing his name, Oler with an E and uh, without an E, but he prefers to have it with the e, with an E because that sound makes it sound more French. And then in 39 he's uh, conscripted, in 40 uh, Vichy issues the anti-Jewish laws and he, they revoke 
his nationality. Um, he is apprehended in 43 and sent to Auschwitz in March in convoy 49. That's a bit uh, of an awkward convoy because then they increased the number of uh, members of the uh, Birkenau Sonderkommando. All the healthy young men in convoy 49 were sent to the Sonderkommando. <laughs> After the war, David Ole returns in 45. His uh, wife and his uh, son don't hardly recognize their husband and father. They are confronted with a man whose only wish, his, the, the only desire and the only obsession is to testify about what he's uh, experienced. And I suggest we uh, now listen to what he uh, says about this himself. Because um, I'm hurting too, too much every day, I wake up and I suffer. That's, every day is a day of suffering. My wife's uh, fed up with it, it's been 35 years like that. I want everybody to understand this, even the illiterates. This is, uh, my language is uh, international. I can't leave it behind me. I can't leave it behind me. Uh, it's uh, as if I'm still there, as if it happened yesterday, not 35 years ago. En effet, à partir de son retour, donc, et jusqu'à sa mort en 1995, je vous le disais, la seule chose que David Oller voulait faire, c'était de témoigner. Et initialement, en 1945-1947, some of them are very familiar, some of you are very familiar with them, K3, where he had to work, five sketches, which are very, very detailed and precise, and they will be uh, completely corroborated afterwards by the archives, uh, which will be uh, discovered afterwards. So that it's about a hundred drawings. They show us everything um, David Oler has seen. He's seen a lot more than the other members, the, the other prisoners and the other members of the Zonderkommando because as a rule of thumb, uh, well, maybe you know that in 44, uh, were already uh, allocated to a specific location because at the crematorium, for instance, the work was a lot more organized. So some people, the, the Heitzer, the Stokers, uh, for instance, were attributed to stoking. And David Oler had a particular role to play. And 
He therefore didn't have a specific um, task. He simply had to replace people uh, whenever somebody had to be replaced uh, in and around the crematoria. That means that he's seen a lot more than the other members of the Zonda Commando, and he could testify on a lot, on many more things. Two details, on two different uh, images. So, left is David Oler's uh, drawing, and I suggest you uh, compare it to a picture taken by an SS soldier at the time of the uh, ovens, and just see how detailed David Oler uh, has drawn the, the ovens. He has, really has a photographic memory. It's as if in his mind he kept pictures of uh, what happened at the time. These documents are of very, very high value. So, initially, it's uh, about uh, David Oler proposes uh, drawings and subsequently he moves towards a painting and sculpting. In the movie you see that uh, he has a house in, um, has a garden in a house in Noisy. Uh, Noisy is uh, close to Paris. It used to be linked to Paris by a tramway, a streetcar. And in his uh, Noisy house he makes his um, sculptures. And this shift from drawings and sketches towards sculptures also uh, is also a mental process. So the expression methods of the artist occupy more space. Um, for example, here we see uh, how he develops an allegory and it's really an, an artistic uh, expression, various force lines, the choice of specific colors, etc. David Oler dies in 85. That's all on uh, David Oler's biography. But if you want more information, I can uh, uh, refer you to my website where you find various page, uh, pages dedicated to David Oler. Now, what's going to happen to um, all these works, artistic works? Well, not a great deal because they seem to be, uh, they don't seem to interest anybody, which is weird because he's an eyewitness. He tries to um, organize exhibitions. The first person who visits him is Miriam Novic, and uh, she sets up uh, in Galilea, in Israel, um, a museum for um, victims of the war. And she gathers testimonials from Europe, and she meets David Oler in um, 76. And she asks him to lend her uh, some of his uh, works, five paintings, three sculptures, and about 50 drawings. Who thought he was lending her the works, and but uh, today these drawings are still in the archives of this museum. I've had the fortune of um, seeing them. And uh, I can tell you that you see the, the glove, the, the hand, the gloved hand of the uh, archive keeper, they, they really take good care of it. Um, but these works at the same time are not visible to, to the general public, they're kept in a drawer. And then the sculptures are by David Oler, uh, they were put uh, outside the house because the inside, the interior of the house was completely covered with uh, paintings. 
1981, there's been uh, some vandalism. Apparently, it had nothing to do with anti-Semitism, but a um, great deal of the statues has been uh, damaged. Um, and underneath, there's uh, le cri, the cry, which is where I got the title for my uh, presentation. Most of the um, sculptures have been distributed amongst private persons. And then there's uh, paintings. There was an agreement between uh, David Allaire's uh, son Alexandre and Serge Osver. And so they will be kept in two places, but 40 works will be kept at Yad Vashem and about 18 of them at the Museum for Jewish Heritage in New York, and especially the one where, which you see here and next to it, David Oler. Uh, and you can see for yourself that David Oler's paintings are often quite big. These um, paintings were given to New York and Jerusalem, and in no case, however, they are part of the permanent collection. So they are uh, kept in the archives, so the general public can't really see them. As far as I know, there's only one artwork which is visible, and I'm glad to say it's in France. That's at the Champigny Museum. Uh, it's the painting we're looking at now. I think it's a real pity that only one painting is being exhibited in France, because he chose France as his uh, new country, and I think uh, at least a uh, whole room should be dedicated to David Oler. Then, as of uh, 18, the, qual the eyewitness quality of David Oler's um, works has been uh, recognized, and the Museum for Ghetto uh, Combatants opened in 1980 in Israel, and remember this is uh, 35 years after he started making the works and five years before he died. And then there's a part of them in Yad Vashem, and then there's also an ex exhibition in 2005 at the Shoah Memorial. There was about 50 works of him. There's also the movie of uh, Jean Boussuge, um, where um, a movie is dedicated to him in very scarce um, circumstances, very difficult financial circumstances. And what I showed you earlier on was um, a part of the Jean Boussuge's uh, movie. It's shocking, from my perspective, that ever since they surfaced, the negationists got hold of them. They got hold of David Oler's works and referred to them. But still, I think it's quite interesting as well, because they always uh, focus on the so-called false witnesses which has to be interpreted the other way around. They, by this they mean eyewitnesses. The attention uh, negationists pay to the work of David Oler is actually an acknowledgement of his importance. And um, he gives us a good idea of what happened to the prisoners who were members of the Zonda uh, commandos. <coughs> Allow me to explain to you how I ended up here. About 10 years ago, I wanted to, to um, find out more about uh, David Oler and, uh, and on the Shoah. And I found uh, a great deal of literature 
um, about the Shoah, a lot more than what I could have read during the rest of my life, but um, not, there was not much uh, material available on the victims of the Shoah. Only Polyakov uh, mentioned it in Auschwitz in 64, and Ber Mark had also started um, studying the problem with uh, Voices in the Night, which was also published a few weeks before his death. In France, this uh, was only published in 82. As of um, the 80s, there's a new stage, there's the movie Shoah from Claude Lanzmann, with uh, the unforgettable uh, testimonial of Philippe Muller, uh, whose book was published uh, in German and French um, in 79, and then uh, finally, uh, interviews with uh, survivors from the Sonderkommando who lived in uh, Israel via Weinten Tränenlos from Gideon uh, Greif. So we wept without tears, published in uh, English in 2005, in German in 1995, which uh, gives a good idea about the prisoners in the Sonderkommandos. And then finally, the work of Andreas Kilian who um, published his work in 2005 only in German. I don't think there's a, an English uh, translation who would make the work accessible to everybody. We could also wonder why that is. So for all these different testimonies that we have and the specificities, from the point of view of arts, in 1997, the great uh, Yad Vashem exhibition was the uh, real and only first real uh, um, time it was listened to. This testimony was heard 50 years later, but still it was full of warnings and hesitation regarding the violence that it contained. Um, indeed, David Oler's painting are full of violence. So the speech or the written form uh, have less violence than his paintings? Well, we know how difficult it is to hear the witnesses when they uh, come back. All prisoners, not only the prisoners of the Zonder Commando, but when later they are heard and their testimonies are studied, the Zonder Commando are always excluded, even though they wanted to testify. They uh, went to meet the uh, investigation commissions, they turned up to the trials, of course. They also uh, doing their best to testify in Poland. And when three former uh, detainees of the Zonderkommando are uh, turning up to a trial, this is a considerable uh, action because there aren't that many of them left. And it clearly shows the, uh, how much their desire they want to testify how much will they have. And uh, when it comes to the written testimony now, it's clear that they know something really special and this uh, knowledge that they have is essential and they are responsible for its uh, passing on. And before uh, 45, as early as uh, before 45, the uh, manuscripts are buried. Kradowski even said, go and search every single piece of land in Birkenau. We have buried dozens of documents there. This uh, argument is uh, confirmed by other prisoners of uh, Zondor Commando. Uh, many, many uh, books are buried. Many Many manuscripts are buried underground, but uh, as far as I know, they have not been dug out. Uh, it took a long, long time before they were uh, studied, at least partly. And as far as I know, the first publishing of these manuscripts took place in 1996 in Inmitten. 
uh, by the Auschwitz Museum. So did in Mitten uh, work. There is of course a monument that is inaugurated in 67. So when it comes to the rebellion now, you would think this subject is uh, at least more interesting. Uh, showing you the uh, image of the manuscript by Mr. <laughs> Nadjari. So the rebellion of the Zonder Commander should have been uh, better listened to, especially to uh, speak out against this idea of cattle. Did the Jews uh, let themselves walk to the uh, slaughterhouse as cattle? So it should be an interesting argument to speak against this, but um, there are four women that are mentioned. They are considered as heroes, and they are heroes. They acted as heroes, but still, uh, I think personally that Let's, we shouldn't forget that the hundreds of victims of the Zonderkommando, the Arbeitsansatz, tells us that there were 663 prisoners uh, in the morning of this rebellion. So we know that over half of this uh, group was uh, slaughtered. And uh, the 14 prisoners uh, accused of being the biggest uh, leaders, the biggest uh, fermenters of this rebellion are taken to the block, are tortured for a month before they are uh, put down. So we shouldn't forget these people. So why is it that we can't hear this scream? Why uh, can it not be heard? Why is it not wanted? Well, one could say that there is a specific violence in his testimony, and uh, this is disturbing. And that's a fact, indeed. It is very violent, but that is not enough. The history of the Shoha is uh, anyway violent, is anyway a history of terror and horror. So can it be that these men themselves are special men? Are they different? This uh, theory is uh, not particularly sensible, but maybe in order to get rid of it, we have to analyze it. How are they picked, these people? Welcome, like all men and women of all commandos, based on a given need at a given time. And the members of the Zonda Commando were like you and me, you just had to be young, be a man, and look healthy. So the theory of voluntary collaboration that was, by the way, mentioned after the war by the media, and that is uh, understandable in a way, or at least imaginable, because the relationships between the Zonderkommando and other prisoners being uh, prohibited and impossible, then the survivors that weren't part of this commando, so men that were uh, decently dressed, who were not cold in the winter, who were reasonably fed and uh, wore shoes, things that were absolutely extraordinary in Birkenau. So when you um, read about this voluntary collaboration, you can understand where this uh, idea came from. But very quickly, it was understood that this wasn't the case. They were only uh, selected uh, based on the needs of the, Zonda, of the SS. So how can you reproach to these men to have been what they had been forced to become? This is uh, what survivors were accused of uh, when uh, other when the people that had stayed at home saw that their father or brother never came back, but these members of the Zonderkommando came back, they said, why are you back? How did you manage to make it? And of course, they were hinting that uh, something had to be done to be able to survive. But they said, we just uh, did what we were forced to do. Uh, under the threat of being killed if we didn't comply. 
à cette notion de zone, de zone grise hein, qui... Mais il y a toujours une zone grise, une zone grise qui qualifie les zones de commando. Pour moi, cette zone grise n'existe pas. Pour moi, ce n'est pas vrai du tout. Il n'y a pas de zone de grise. Une fois encore, c'est une perception injuste de la zone de commando de la zone de commando de la zone de commando de la zone de commando. And I think this has to be applied to the camp as a whole. Why wouldn't we consider that detainees working at Ashkab HKB at the hospital, for example, and that was forced to prepare the selection for the gas chambers with the SS soldier? Why wouldn't it be considered as being part of the gray area? Or why wouldn't the couple that uh, uh, was uh, forced to ki kill men and his uh, uh, army during the day. So once again, the uh, Zonda commando is the shameful one. So maybe we should uh, use some manichaeism, try and see things in black and white, instead of always seeing this uh, gray area. And clearly, I know there are executors and there are victims. We all agree on this. I'm not going against this idea. But clearly, the Shoah literature, whereas you are considering uh, historian literature or uh, simple testimonies from uh, victims, uh, seem to uh, really label phenomenon in order to uh, harness reality, but crematoriums remain a place without any humanity and without any hope. So uh, we want Zonda Commando members to uh, refuse their fate. We want them to commit suicide, to refuse massively which has happened anyway, but uh, it seems that we want no single uh, Jew to have accepted to be a Zonda Commando, as if we said, we could have done it, we would have gone against it, we would have spoken out, we would have refused. But let's not forget, these Zonda Commandos are human beings, and our humanity also includes some share of uh, no humanity. In our humanity, there is a, a part that is blank. And finally, we have to agree that the Zonda commandos are like us, and we don't want to admit this. Thank you.